Welcome to Lingthusiasm, a podcast that's enthusiastic about linguistics. I'm Gretchen McCulloch. And I'm Lauren Gorn, and today we're getting enthusiastic about old languages. But first, our most recent bonus episode was deleted scenes with three of our interviews from this year. We had deleted scenes from our live show Q&A with Kirby Conrad about language and gender. We talked about reflexive pronouns, multiple pronouns in fiction, and talking about people who use multiple pronoun sets. We also have an excerpt from our interview with Chasso Rodriguez Ordonez about Basque, because it's famous among linguists for having ergativity. We wanted to know, what do Basque people themselves think about ergativity? It turns out there are jokes and cartoons about it, which Ichasa was able to share with us. Amazing and charming. And finally, we have an excerpt from my conversation with authors Ada Palmer and Joe Walton about swearing in science fiction and fantasy. This excerpt talks about acronyms, both of the sweary and non-sweary kind. You can get this bonus episode, as well as a whole bunch more, at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Also, yeah, maybe this is a good time to remember that we have over 80 bonus episodes. We have bonus episodes about the time a researcher smuggled a bunny into a classroom to do linguistics on children. We also have a bonus episode about the quick brown fox jumps over the lazy dog and more phrases that contain all the letters of the alphabet, plus what people do with phrases like this in languages that don't have alphabets. We also have an entire bonus episode that's just about the linguistics of numbers. So if you wish you had more Lingthusiasm episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help us keep making this podcast long into the future, we really appreciate everyone who becomes a patron. And you can find all of that at patreon.com slash lingthusiasm. Hey, Lauren, I've got big news. Yeah? Did you know I'm from the oldest family lineage in the world? Wow. You sound like you are part of some prestigious, ancient, royal, I can only assume royal, with that level of knowledge about your family lineage. Well, you know, like, I have some family members who are really into genealogy, I've been looking at some family trees, and I have come to the conclusion that my family is the oldest family in the world. Mm, You know, I have grandparents, and they have grandparents, and I assume they had grandparents, and I, I guess my family goes all the way back as well. We didn't come out of nowhere. I might not know all their names, and I don't think we were ever rulers of any nation state as far as I'm aware. But uh, I I don't know if you are from the oldest family lineage, because I think everyone is. Well, this is not a mutually exclusive statement. I can be from the oldest family lineage, and you can be from the oldest family lineage, and everyone listening to this podcast can be all from the oldest family lineage in the world, because we're all descended from the earliest humans. This is a good point. <laughs> Psych. And I think it's definitely worth remembering the difference between the very fact that we are all from the same humans and the difference between that and knowing names of specific individuals back to a certain point. And I should clarify, I am not royalty. I do not actually know the names all the way back because at a certain point, writing stops existing. And at some point before that, people stopped recording my ancestors <laughs> and I don't know when it stops. But there's definitely a tradition in like certain royal families and stuff of being able to claim that you can trace your family back to, you know, maybe like Apollo or something. Oh, gosh, like mythical characters. Okay, yeah, I was thinking of just like, tracing them back a thousand years. But I I guess tracing them back to Adam and Eve or tracing them back to, you know, like Helen of Troy or Apollo or these sorts of things. I I feel like at least I've heard of this. And I think that talking about human ancestral lineages helps us make sense of the types of claims that people also make about languages being the oldest language. Hmm. I feel like I've heard this before, different languages making claim to being the oldest language. I've heard it quite a lot. I did a bit of research and I looked up a list of some languages that people have claimed to be the oldest. Okay. What did you find? A lot of things that can't all be true at the same time. Or can all be true, because all languages are descended from some early human capacity for human language. (laughs) Right. So there's sort of different geographical hotspots. Mm -hmm. You have people making claims about Egyptian, about Sanskrit, Greek, Chinese, Aramaic, Farsi, Tamil, Korean, Basque. Speaking of Basque episodes. Oh, yeah. Sometimes people look at reconstructed languages like Proto-Indo-European, which is, you know, the old thing that 
the modern day Indo-European languages are descended from. Mm -hmm. But part of the issue here is that at least for spoken languages, and we're going to get to sign languages. Yeah. But at least for spoken languages, like babies can't raise themselves. Unfortunately, I personally have to say. <laughs> After Deeply and conveniently. Years. Yeah. <laughs> for adult sleep schedules. So if you have a baby with typical hearing and they're being raised in a, you know, community or even by one person, mm -hmm. they're going to acquire language from the people that are raising it. Absolutely. And yeah, in much the same way we all have people giving us genetic input, we also have people giving us linguistic input and uh, continuing on that transmission of human language. Right. Exactly. And so, when a language is claimed to be old, that's often more of sort of a political claim or a religious claim or a heritage claim mm -hmm. than it is a linguistic claim because we think that languages probably have a common ancestor. Certainly all languages are learnable by all humans. If you raise a baby in a given environment, they'll grow up with the language that's around them. So the human capacity for language seems to be common across all of us. And we just don't know what that tens of thousands year old early languages looked like. In much the same way, we lose track of earlier ancestors when we get earlier than written records. There's also, we talked about this in the Reconstructing Old Languages episode, that there's just a point where you can't go back further because there's just not enough information to say exactly how Proto-Indo-European might have at some earlier point been related to, say, the Sino-Tibetan languages or the Niger-Congo family. Right. And, you know, we also talked about this in the writing systems episode where writing systems have been invented, you know, about 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 years ago, but human language probably emerged sometime between 50,000 and 150,000 years ago, which is so much older. That's yeah. like 10 times to 30 times older than that. And we don't know because sounds and signs leave impressions on the airwaves that vanish very quickly and don't leave fossils until writing starts being developed much later. Very inconvenient. Yeah, absolutely the first thing I would do with a time machine. All of those languages that you mentioned as people laying claim to them being the oldest, they come from all kinds of different language families. Although I have to say a very like Indo-European Western skew there, which probably reflects the corners of the internet that you have access to. Right. So this reflects the people that are making claims like this on the English speaking internet that I'm looking at mm -hmm. and the sort of modern day nation states and religious traditions and cultural traditions that are making claims to certain types of legitimacy via having access to old texts or having access to uninterrupted transmission of stories and legends and mythologies that give them those sorts of claims. There's no reason to think that, you know, a whole bunch of languages on the, you know, North and South American continents are not also equally old as all the other languages, but people aren't doing nation state building with them. And so they don't tend to show up on those lists. Yeah. A lot of nation state building, a lot of like religion happening there as well. Yeah. I think about how, you know, yoga is, look, I love a bit of yoga and I think it's really lovely that all the yoga terms are still given to you in this kind of older Sanskritic language, but it definitely is done sometimes with this like, claim to legitimacy and kind of prestige in the same way that, you know, having something in Latin for the Catholic Church gives that same kind of vibe. I think about this scene from the movie My Big Fat Greek Wedding, uh -huh. where you have the daughter who's the one that's, that's getting married and she's in the car as a teen with her parents. And it's this sort of scene where the parents are being a bit cringy in the way that, you know, teens often experience their parents to be. Mm -hmm. And the dad is saying, you know, name a word, I will tell you how it comes from Greek, because he's got this big Greek pride thing going. And this is a, like classic Greek American migrant pride happening. Right. And so he says arachnophobia, and he's explaining, you know, how the roots come from Greek, and that one's true. And then the daughter's friend who's in the back seat is sort of rolling her eyes and saying, well, what about kimono? Uh, kimono, the Japanese robe. Yes. Mm -hmm. And the dad's like, oh, no, it's from Greek. Here's this connection that I have found. <laughs> I like his 
linguistic ad-libbing skills. Right. It's certainly a great improvisational performance skills. And the movie is clearly designed to put the viewer in sympathy with the young girls in the back seat who are sort mm-hmm. of teasing him and the daughter sort of face palming, you know, at this claim, which is one of the reasons why it's like one of my favorite examples of people making up fake etymologies in media, because mm-hmm. you don't leave the movie thinking, oh, I never realized Komodo was from Greek. You leave that movie being <laughs> <laughs> like, Lying. ah, here's this dad who has sort of over-exaggerated pride in his heritage that doesn't allow for other people's heritage to also have, you know, words that come from them. Yeah. But it's a claim that he's making for, you know, personal reasons and for heritage reasons that doesn't have linguistic founding, but none of these claims have linguistic founding. The dad has come kind of close to a linguistic truth, though, which is that linguists talk about languages having features that can be either conservative or innovative. Mm. And modern Greek has a lot of the same sound features as ancient Greek, which is probably helped by that consistent writing system. A writing system definitely helps transmission stay stable because you can point back to older texts. English has probably slowed down a lot in its change because of the writing system as well. And genuinely, English has borrowed a lot of words from Greek, as well as a lot of other languages that are not Greek. And this sort of gets to both Greek and Sanskrit and Chinese having these eras that are talked about as classical Mm -hmm. or as old, which is an era that the present day people or some, you know, slightly earlier group people looked back on and thought, yeah, those people were doing some cool stuff. We're going to call it classical because we liked it in history. I do love the idea that Chaucer had no idea that he was moving on from Old English to Middle English because there wasn't a modern English yet. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, how could you describe yourself as Middle English? That's sort of like the late stage capitalism, uh, you know, (laughs) that implies that we're towards the end of something. Like, we don't know, folks. (laughs) And like, I don't think English always does self-deprecating well. Like, English has a lot of belief in its superiority as a language. I think we Mm. could say that about the kind of ideology behind English. But I do I do love that English didn't go for classical English. Like imagine if we said uh, Beowulf was written in classical English. We could have, yeah. Yeah. We could have. We just went with like, oh that's old. I don't understand it. <laughs> it's got cases, it's got all these extra affixes. I don't, it's old. It's a bit stuffy. And that may have been because they were comparing it already to classical Latin and classical Mm. Greek, which was sort of even more antique and this sort of – the English speakers were looking elsewhere for their golden age. Yeah. And so I don't think people often claim that English is the oldest language because English speakers are seeing the history of their society located in this Greco-Latin tradition. Yeah. I think that's a good explanation for it. I do wonder if like maybe – you know, the attitudes that we now have towards like Shakespearean English, if maybe that will become like classical English <laughs> when we're a bit further on and Shakespeare becomes even less accessible. Right. Well, and if, if Shakespeare becomes the kind of text that everyone is like referring to because it's this quote unquote classic text, but calling something a classical era reflects on the subsequent era and what they thought about the older one more so than the era itself. Yeah. And having this ability to distinguish between like an old or a classical and a modern version of a language requires that writing tradition, whereas the majority of human languages for the majority of human history have happily existed and transmitted knowledge without a writing system. Um, These writing systems make us very focused on pinning down. I super appreciate the website Glottolog, Mm -hmm. which catalogues languages and all the names they're known by. So we have a lot of languages that are classical. Ooh like classical Chinese or classical Quechua. Mm. We have some early, so early Irish. I think I've also heard of old Irish. Yep. We have old Chinese and old Japanese in Glottolog, but I've definitely also heard them referred to as classical. So different, slightly different vibes there. Mm-hmm. And of course, you have things like ancient Hebrew, which- Ah, ancient. You know, yes. Older, older than old, mm-hmm. very prestigious. <laughs> I particularly like the- precision with which some names get given to different languages over time. So Glottolog has an old modern Welsh, okay, which is nice and specific. And I particularly appreciate the Imperial Middle Modern Aramaic. Imperial Middle Modern Aramaic. Well, that also gets to languages 
being named and being spread through empire and conquest mm. and wars, which is also part of that historical tradition that people look back to. For sure. And that's part of the narrative building around languages. A lot of what is maintained about a language is religious documents or documents of imperial rule. And that means that, you know, that imperial form might have been a particular register. Imagine if all that we had about English was the tax forms that we have. <laughs> oh, oh. God, that would be really boring. Uh, you would have a very different idea of what English is compared to how it's spoken day to day. And that's what makes this kind of understanding of older languages just from a written record really challenging. When I think about trying to understand the history of languages just from the written record. Mm -hmm. I'm reminded of this sort of classic joke. I don't know if you've heard this one, where, you know, you're walking down the street one night and you see someone standing under a street light, sort of looking at their feet and like trying to search for something. Mm -hmm. And you go, oh, what are you looking for? And the person says, oh, my contact lens, it fell out. I'm trying to find it. And you say, oh, did you lose it under the street light? And the person goes, no, I lost it, you know, like a block over that way, but there's no street light there. So it's much easier to search here. <laughs> <laughs> I guess this is a joke that doesn't work so well now that everyone has phones with flashlights on them um, and contact lenses have improved their technology and don't pop out spontaneously like that. But when we're looking for the history of language, it's like looking under the streetlight because that's where it's easy to look. Yeah, It's not actually doing sort of a random sample of all of the bits of history, many of which are just lost to us. Indeed. I like thinking about the imperial languages and the classical languages because sometimes we do get written records that help give us a glimpse into just how ordinary people were going about living their lives. Oh, 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 oh. Can we talk about the clay tablet? We can absolutely talk about the clay tablet that I know what you mean, because <laughs> you're talking about the complaint to Ea Nasir, which is a clay tablet that's written in Arcadian cuneiform, and it's considered to be the world's oldest known written complaint. And this is from a customer named Nani, who's complaining about the quality of the copper ingots that was received. The thing that I love about this is that there is this complaint, but also they're pretty sure they found Ernesia's house, because <laughs> there are other complaints about the quality of the copper in this <laughs> residence. <laughs> so we really think we know like who's at fault here. Yeah. It seems like he was just a provider of adequate quality copper, and people really needed to go to a better place to get a better quality of copper. And cuneiform is also this interesting example of sort of searching under the streetlight for the contact lens, mm -hmm. because the language Sumerian was written in cuneiform, and then later Akkadian, which is a Semitic language related to modern day Arabic and Hebrew, and Hittite, which is an Indo-European language related to English and Sanskrit and a bunch of other languages. And they were all using this system of stamping the ends of reeds in these sort of pointy triangle shapes onto clay blocks. Do you know what happens to clay blocks when they're in a house and the house burns down? They just get fired and made more resilient. They get made incredibly durable. If people were writing on, you know, parchment or in textiles, like in, you know, fabrics or cords or strings or mm -hmm. on leather or wood, most of those don't get preserved the same way because you expose them to water and they start rotting. Yeah. And they don't do great with fire. <laughs> they don't really don't do great with fire. <laughs> Animals will eat them. Clay has none of these problems. So yeah. we don't even know if we know what all of the ancient writing systems are because the ones that have survived are the ones on clay or stone. I was so charmed when I learned about Latin curse tablets, Ooh. which are very similar to the complaints to Aeonesia. These are small bits of lead that people could scratch a curse or a wish onto, and then they would throw them into some kind of sacred water. They found like 130 of these at Bath in Britain, but they appear to have popped up all over the Roman Empire. And it's just like these tiny insights into the pettiness of humanity, as opposed to the kind of great works of literature, or we've talked about how the Rosetta Stone was in these like three official languages and was all about like a declaration about taxation. But instead, you can have this like curses on Gaius because he's still my dog sort of thing. I have given to the goddess Sulis the six silver coins which I have lost. It is for the goddess to extract them from the names written below. Oh. And then just like lists people who owe this person cash. Oh. 
Yeah. <laughs> That's petty. I like it. <laughs> yeah. So annoyed. I actually read a romance novel called Mortal Follies by Alexis Hall, uh, which was set in Bath and used the ancient Bath curse tablets as a plot point. So charming. Anyone wants to read curse tablets and also sort of romanticy, I think is what we're calling the genre now. I feel like Jane Austen would have included curse tablets if she knew about them. Yeah, I think she was no stranger to pettiness. <laughs> It's very convenient that they wrote their curses on lead tablets, which is such an incredibly durable format. Imagine if they'd written them on cloth and then we'd never have them for posterity. I feel sad for all the human pettiness that we've lost access to. <laughs> At two other old writing systems that mm -hmm. we have access to because of the durability of the materials they were written on, our Oracle Bone script, oh, which yeah. is the ancestor to Chinese, yep. another writing system that we think developed from scratch because we can sort of see it developing thousands of years ago. Oracle Bones written on, I believe, like turtle bones and turtle, turtle shells. shells. Yes. Um, I th hence the bone part, also yep. very durable material and also used for religious purposes. My sympathy and thanks to the turtles. <laughs> Indeed. And then the early Mesoamerican writing systems, of which the oldest one is the Olmec writing system, mm -hmm. which were written on ceramics. And they show representations of drawings of things that look sort of like a codex-shaped book made out of bark, which obviously we don't have. We just have oh. ceramic drawings of the bark. Oh, come on! Oh, no. Oh, it's so close. How cruel to point out that we're missing information. Like, you thought you were mad about the Library of Alexandria burning down? Wait till you hear about the Olmec bark. Yeah. Oh, that really gets you. And just as a reminder of how much we can't say about the history of human language because of what we don't have a record of. Well, you know, before we do a whole episode about things that we don't know, because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, much as we can sort of make fun of searching for the contact lens under the streetlight, we don't know what we don't know. Indeed. What's something else that people sometimes mean when they say a language is old? Well, this goes back to that conservative idea that some languages just have conservative features that haven't changed as much. And a language that has a lot of sound changes, we might call very innovative, or they've innovated a new way of doing the tense on the verbs and so you can trace it back to an older form of the language, but it looks very different at this point in time. So I think the example that I'm most familiar with this is Icelandic versus English. So in the last thousand years or so, English has had a lot of contact from things like the Norman Conquest, which introduced a lot of French words to English, compared to Icelandic, which has had less of that. Mm -hmm. So Icelanders have an easier time reading something like their sagas, which are 800 and more years old, than English speakers have reading texts like Chaucer, which are about the same age, but have had a lot more linguistic changes happening because of more contact in English over the years. And that's one of the things that linguists who look at, you know, when a language tends to be more innovative and change, it tends to be during these periods of contact, it tends to be during periods of invasion. And English, you know, had the French come up from the south, repeated Viking incursions from all around the coast, and they all had an impact on the language. And I find it really interesting, you know, Icelanders are really proud of how conservative the language is and that they still can read these older stories. And I think, you know, in some ways, English has created the story for itself where it's really proud of the fact that it is this language that continues to take influences from places and is really innovative you know, these are just part of the story that a language can tell about itself and the speakers can tell about it. Right. And I think that there are reasons to be proud of any language that don't have to rely on age as the sole arbiter of legitimacy. Hmm. And in some cases, it's that rupture with the past that people use as a point of pride. I'm thinking of Haitian Creole, for example, mm -hmm. which is descended from French. And you can sort of hear that French influence. Like when I've heard people speaking Haitian Creole, it almost sounds like they're speaking just like a French dialect that I don't quite know. Right. Okay. But the writing system is very different and it's much more phonetic than French is. So the word for me in Haitian Creole is moi, and it's written M-W-A. And the word for me in modern French is moi, pronounced the same way, but written M-O-I. Right. 
And it used to be pronounced Moy. This is why you get like Roy and Roi for king and stuff like this, hence the spelling. But the sound change has happened in French. And when the Haitian speakers were deciding how to write their language down, they were like, no, we're going to have a phonetic system. We don't need to be beholden to the French system. We're going to have something <laughs> that establishes our identity as something that's distinct from French. For anyone who's tried to learn their French spelling, especially those endings that are still in the writing system, but not in the pronunciation system. I think it's fair to say French has gone through a number of sound innovations, even if it might be more conservative in other features of the grammar. It's very conservative in the writing system, but the sounds have changed a lot. Yeah. It's interesting you bring up Haitian Creole because Creoles are the result of this intense contact between two or more languages and they often get labeled as being new, which is kind of the flip side of this discourse around old languages. Yeah. And that's sort of controversial in linguistics, whether to consider Creoles new mm -hmm. or, or to consider them older. What they definitely have is, you know, children being raised by people who also already had some amount of language and, you know, babies can't raise themselves. But they do have this situation where their speakers were prevented from learning how to read and write or learning how to access the formal varieties of language, mm -hmm. often very violently and through horrible circumstances. A lot of Creoles came about because of slave trade, because of, you know, historical systems of oppression. So the language transmission was not the same as if you were learning it from parents who'd been educated in the language. But they were still learning from people who had access to the language. And so there's been a bit of a swing in Creole studies more recently to say, what if we don't consider these completely new? What if we think about the ancestral features that they have in common with the languages they're descended from, which you can readily trace as well? And thinking in terms of like, which features are innovative rather than the whole language is being new, like maybe it has a very innovative way of doing like the noun structure but it still has a lot of the features of the two different or multiple different languages in terms of sounds. And so taking apart the different linguistic elements and not just focusing on the whole thing as being new or old and trying to apply these labels that don't actually account for what's happening. Right. And it can be kind of exoticizing to Creoles to say, oh, these are completely different from all of the other ways that languages have gotten transmitted, when what's also going on is – kids in a community who are exposed to a bunch of languages or a bunch of different linguistic inputs at a time, kind of making sense of that and coming up with collaboratively something with the other kids in the community that is different from what people were speaking before, but it still has that ancestral link. There are contexts in which children are raised without that access to language transmission. And that is when a deaf child is born into a hearing and spoken language family context, which means that they're not getting that language. Right. And generally, the child and the, the parents and the family and, you know, community members do end up with some amount of ways of communicating, sort of based on the existing gestures that people do alongside of spoken language and elaborating on them, making them more complex because you are trying to communicate somehow. Um, there are linguists who study this, right? Yeah. I mean, ideally, in an ideal world, if you're a deaf child, you would want to have access to signed language input through ideally your family, but also like your wider educational context. Some deaf children do get hearing aids. They are useful, but not a perfect replication of the hearing child experience. And so that's a possibility. But there are some contexts where children have just develop this communication system with their hearing family in their own home context. And these are known as home sign and they have been examples of this and they have been studied. One of the most famous examples that has been described in a lot of detail is the example of David and his family and Susan Golden Meadow and her collaborators over the years have done a lot of work looking at the way David and especially his mother communicate with each other. This is a really tough situation. And I think these studies started in like the early 90s. And hopefully people know better now and can give their deaf kids access to a sign language. But given that this happened, what can we learn from the situation? Golden Meadow definitely started publishing about this in the early 80s. Okay, so even earlier. David, who I will forever think of as like a seven to 10 year old child, 
is actually like a Gen Xer <laughs> who, if he had kids himself, they're like undergraduates. <laughs> okay, now. okay. Yeah, it's good to put like famous children from studies in perspective. Yeah, because they are, you know, it's like the Shirley Temple phenomenon, right? Yeah. David, in my mind, is always just this kid who's learning to communicate with his mom, but he's a fully grown taxpaying adult now. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, and what was he doing when he was communicating with his mum in this, you know, immortalized in amber childhood years? What was really interesting from a, you know, thinking about this human capacity for language and communication perspective is that his mother and the family kind of developed this way of communicating with him that kind of grew out of their typical gestures and kind of context, a lot of, you know, showing each other stuff. Like pointing to things and so on? Oh, pointing. So useful in all languages and all contexts. But what they found was that David was creating systematic order out of the gestures that he was getting. So he had more systematic structure in terms of the hand shape that he was using. He created Mm. these kind of hand shape structures and these individual signs that his mum would also use, but not as consistently as him. So Mm. it's actually the child taking this really idiosyncratic, raw gesture material from his mum, and gestures in spoken language context tend to be a bit more freeform and unstructured than, say, something like a signed language, which uses the same hands, but in a very different way. And he wasn't doing something that was like a fully structured language, but it had more structure than what he was being given. So his brain was really sort of starved for linguistic input, and he Mm. was trying to like extract as many sort of linguistic vitamins and minerals as he could from (laughs) this sort of incomplete gestural system that he was being given as the closest approximation to language. And obviously, we do wish that David, who was raised in the US, I think, I think, had just been given access to ASL, which lots of people already were using in the US and could have happened where he would have gotten, you know, sort of the fully fledged, healthy, balanced diet of lots of linguistic input from lots of people. But the child brain seems to want to reconstruct language out of whatever is available to it. And this type of system, which is often called home sign, is not the same as a fully fledged sign language. And children often don't have the same level of linguistic structure. They obviously can't communicate with people outside of the home context who don't know the signs that they've created with the family. But I think it's also worth pointing out that it is more structured than you would expect it to be from the input. And we've seen when you take children from these emerging structures and you bring enough deaf people together, you actually get a real blossoming of a full linguistic system. And the most famous example of this is in Nicaragua in the 1980s, Mm -hmm. where a bunch of deaf children were brought together at a school for the first time. And the school wasn't trying to teach them a signed language. They were trying to do sort of an oralist method of education, which is mm, uh, <laughs> but <laughs> about which the least, less said the better. But the kids themselves were coming in with their home sign systems and developing them further in contact with each other. And when the next generation of kids showed up and they had access to this sort of combined home sign system, they really turned mm-hmm. it into a full-fledged sign language, which is now Nicaraguan Sign Language, and is the national sign language of Nicaragua. So these types of languages are some good candidates for youngest language, even if we don't know what the oldest language looks like. The amazing thing about Nicaraguan Sign Language is that there were linguists on the ground pretty much from the beginning of the school in the 1980s, and there is a documentation of how this language has evolved, and it was the older signers coming in communicating with the younger children coming to the school who then created more of the structure. So being a bit like David, but in this really rich communicative and linguistic environment and building this structure into the language. So it seems to sort of take those two generations of linguistic input, but that feels very reassuring to me, which is that language is so robust that even if we lose all of our writing systems and we lose all of our memory of writing systems and we lose uh, access to memory of of what language looks like, suddenly we all wake up with amnesia or something, we (laughs) would rediscover this, uh, even though they wouldn't be the same languages, we'd put something back together and still be able to talk to each other. And we know this because Nicaraguan Sign Language is not the only example we have of a recently developed language that has emerged. 
Nicaraguan Sign Language is a school-based sign, Mm -hmm. but we also have what are known as village-based sign systems, which is where there might be a deaf family or a number of deaf families in the village or a very high percentage of deaf population, and a sign language emerges that the whole village, deaf and hearing, use to communicate. And it's usually village because it is these smaller communities where people gather and live together and have to communicate with each other all the time. And where it's if you have like an island or a you know somewhere in a in the mountains or somewhere where there's a high degree of genetic deafness because there's a relatively high degree of isolation and so you can have like a third of the village be deaf in which case everybody in that village is learning signs from each other at a young age. I think the famous example of that that I've heard of relatively nearby is Martha's Vineyard in the US. Oh, yeah. Which is an island, I think, and it has a village sign language. Lynn Ho talked about Al Said Bedouin sign language in the interview she did with us, which is in a tribal group in a desert in southern Israel. And there's also Kata Kolok, which is also known as Benkala sign language or Balinese sign language, mm-hmm. which is a village sign language indigenous to two neighboring villages in northern Bali, Indonesia. Similar sort of situations there. And so we see this robustness of language and these young languages, but building on this underlying human tendency to want to create linguistic structure when you bring enough people who can communicate together. A really interesting example that I've encountered recently of what it's like to sort of suddenly have at least access in terms of format or modality to language, even if you don't know what everything means yet, Mm -hmm. is in the book True Biz – by Sarah Novick, oh, yeah. which is set at a school for the deaf. And one of the main characters is a deaf girl whose cochlear implants have been malfunctioning. And so she hasn't been raised with access to a sign language, but suddenly she's in this school now and is learning ASL and trying to get her cochlear implants to still work. But in the meantime, is suddenly immersed in this environment where she has full access to language instead of this sort of piecemeal access via attempting to lip read or attempting to use these implants that haven't been working very well for her. The author is deaf and talks about a variety of different types of experiences that people can have in that context. I really appreciated how this book made the most of the written format to occasionally just not give you what another character was saying. And so you get this experience of being the young protagonist in the book suddenly like, I'm only getting half of this sentence. I don't know what's happening. It's very stressful. Because there's just a bunch of blank spaces. And there were also some places where there were drawings of words that were being talked about or sort of worksheets that she was seeing uh, with line diagrams of different signs. So, you know, despite the fact that it's sort of a book that's in written English trying to convey ASL, which is not English and doesn't have a standard way of being written, Mm. I think it's doing a really interesting job of trying to convey that experience. And that lack of writing system for signed languages means that a lot of the history of signing in human language history has kind of been lost to us. And there have been different signing communities at different times in history. It's probably been a very common way of humans doing language, but we just don't know because it's not in the street light of the written record. Right. And we don't even know if the first language, the oldest language, was a spoken language or a sign language. People have come up with arguments for both things, and we just don't know. Which in some ways I find very relaxing. Mm. Instead of kind of constantly trying to make cases for which language is the oldest or which is the newest, you can kind of just let go of those debates because they are all, at the end of the day, unprovable, and you can just enjoy the variety of human language without it being a competition. Yeah, like a language doesn't have to be the oldest language or even the newest language in order to be cool. Languages are great. All languages are interesting and valid and people should have the right to have access to them when they want them. And by listening to this episode, you're participating in part of that chain of human language transmission that stretches beyond anyone's written record or recorded record or video record. You're still part of it. For more Lingthusiasm and links to all the things mentioned in this episode, go to lingthusiasm.com. You can listen to us on all of the podcast platforms or at lingthusiasm.com. You can get transcripts of every episode at lingthusiasm.com slash transcripts. You can follow at lingthusiasm on all of the social media sites. You can get scarves with lots of linguistics patterns on them, including IPA symbols, branching tree diagrams, 
Booben Kiki and our favorite esoteric Unicode symbols, plus other Lingthusiasm merch like our new Etymology Isn't Destiny t-shirts, and aesthetic IPA posters at lingthusiasm.com slash merch. Links to my social media can be found at GretchenMcCulloch.com, my blog is allthingslinguistic.com, and my book about internet language is called Because Internet. My social media and blog is Superlinguo. Lingthusiasm is able to keep existing thanks to the support of our patrons. If you want to get an extra Lingthusiasm episode to listen to every month, our entire archive of bonus episodes to listen to right now, or if you just want to help keep the show running ad-free, go to patreon.com slash lingthusiasm or follow the links from our website. Patrons can also get access to our Discord chat room to talk to other linguistics fans and be the first to find out about new merch and other announcements. Recent bonus topics include fun interview excerpts, an interview about swearing with Joe Walton and Ada Palmer, and our very special linguistics advice episode, where you asked questions and we answered them. If you can't afford to pledge, that's okay too. We also really appreciate it if you can recommend Lingthusiasm to anyone in your life who's curious about language. Lingthusiasm is created and produced by Gretchen McCulloch and Lauren Gaughan. Our senior producer is Claire Gaughan. Our editorial producer is Sarah Dapiarala. Our production assistant is Martha Tsutsui Billens. And our editorial assistant is John Crook. Our music is Ancient City by The Triangles. Stay Lingthusiastic. Lingthusiastic.